You're listening to Discovering Truth with Dan Duvall. Folks, we are back on Discovering Truth with Dan Duvall. And I'm very excited today. I'm going to tell you the truth. I have a gentleman with me that is absolutely extraordinary. His story is extraordinary. His life is extraordinary. Everything about him is truly extraordinary. His name is Evangelist Joshua Milton Blahi, and he is widely known by the name General Butt Naked. He is a former commander of forces under the wider control of Liberian warlord Roosevelt Johnson. He was known for violence and atrocities during the first Liberian civil war in the early 90s. He has, uh, according to some estimates, killed at least 20,000 people carrying out human sacrifice and cannibalism in his role as a tribal priest. He has a radical story of transformation after meeting Jesus as his Lord and Savior. And folks, he has joined me today to talk about it. Evangelist, welcome to to this podcast. Thank you, brother. Thank you so much. Thank you for giving me the opportunity. Well, I, I, I am excited. And, and folks, here's what you don't know. We had started to record this program uh, over a month ago. And due to technical glitches and issues, we were unable to finish that recording. I almost released it, but it was so good. And it cut off right in the middle of the story. I really didn't have the heart to do it to you. So he is back with me now. We are going to tell the story. I, I, I want to just begin at the beginning, uh, Joshua. You know, you were born under very intentional circumstances. I mean, that's where your story begins. Can you just open up on how your life was brought about? All right. Uh, thank you again, brother, and uh, uh, bless God again for the opportunity. Uh, my father, I'm from the Sapo Kran tribe. In Liberia, we have 16 tribes, and one of the tribes are the Kran tribe. The Kran tribe uh, from Sudan through Africa to Liberia is known as one of the warring tribe in Africa. And in that tribe, there's a section in the tribe called the Sapo. Uh, they has the biggest deity in the entire Southeast, uh, the biggest worship idol or deity in the entire Southeast uh, and this deity is called Nyagbeawe. Nyagbeawe discovered this tribe more than 200 years ago and deceived this tribe to be uh, uh, that he was God almighty. Uh, and from that time to this generation, the tribe have accepted him and worship him. They did everything. The tribe did everything by Nyagbea were quote-unquote blessings. And Nyagbea were interact with the tribe through a priest. So uh, there have never been an ex-priest, a former priest. One priest would die, and the mantle of that priesthood will fall on someone, and that person, wherever they are, whatever they, were, they are doing, they will leave it to answer their prophetic rule for the family. Uh, so the mantle fell on my father. My father was educated and wealthy to some extent. He was uh, the head. He was the uh, uh, the chief of accountant 
chief accountant for the finance ministry in Liberia. When the mantle, when the call came upon him and my father answered the call, when he went, the oracles and the elders said he would never be an effective priest with his wealth and education. So they insisted that he would bring his first son who would be priest in his state. My father was already married, uh, but to a woman from the North. We are from the Southeast. So my father had his first son called Benenik. And he took Benenik to be the priest in his state. But the oracle and the elders also saw that it was Benene would have sold the culture to his mother's tribe. Mm. So they refused to accept Benene as the priest to the client. So my father had to accept an arranged woman because he told them he could not get married since he was already married. So they said he did not need to get married. He only needed to have a child by a woman from the client. So my father said, well, I don't want to make any other mistake finding the woman. So they cast their lot and the lot fell on my mother who was already married with two children. And so tradition insisted that my mother have to join with my father, got pregnant for me, give birth to me, kept me for four years, turned me over to my father and she returned to her husband. My father also kept me for three years. So at the age of seven, my father turned me over to the elders who trained me for four good years from the age of seven to the age of 11 to be the priest to the tribe. At the age of 11, I became the priest of the tribe. It was a great excitement, great excitement to the tribe because for all these years that my father had to produce Try to grow up and be trained and ruled as a priest in his state, the tribe was borrowing a priest to officiate her sacred rites. That is for the fam for the tribe to hear from the gods, they needed a priest to do anything. For example, if the tribe suppose, if it is farming season, the tribe cannot cut one grass or one bush in the forest, except the, the gods give them the blessing and the priests need to hear from the gods. If the tribe have made their crops and a tribe member, one of the tribe members have a very rich farm, rich cassava, rich potato, rich corn, rich rice. That member cannot cultivate one grain of that rice except the gods gave him the go ahead. My. And so even if his child was dying and the child needed a grain of rice to save his life, that member would not touch a grain of rice until the gods gave him the blessings. That's how intense the relationship and the connection and the worship of this God to the Sapo crime tribe is. And so all along, the need to input an equivalent priest who will come from the Jirepo end to come to our quarter to officiate these rites. So he will officiate his before coming to ours. So we were late in farming. 
We were late in cultivating. We were late in every right, every sacrifice that we needed to do for all these years, maybe up to 20 years. So this priest, when I was born and was uh, uh, trained and uh, initiated as the priest, it became a relief and a ceremony to the tribe. Even the president of Liberia at the time was Master Sergeant Samuel Kayando. He was president two years before I became the priest. So to officiate his different rites, he needed to consult the gods through a strange priest, even though with equivalent rank. And so, and so when I was when I emerged as the priest, it was a celebration, a great celebration to the tribe. Uh, wow. Uh, so, yes, so that is the narrative so far. Now, mm -hmm. few points I want to pick up is my father's role in preparing me it's very important because it's, it's one of the rites. It's one of the act. It's one of the worship. It's one of the focus that have affected the church and her significant, and it's significant in the world today. The aspect of effective generation Generational transfer. I wrote a book on it, even though I'm rewriting it because I was not as, you know, intelligent and was sufficient vocabulary uh, when I wrote it some uh, 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 14 years back. And so I want to rewrite it again, you know, because that is the church witness over the years. God said in Genesis chapter 18 that he would not hide anything from Abraham. That Abraham would be a great and a mighty nation. And the reason for that, he said, because he know that Abraham will lead his children and his household after him. That aspect of worship effectively transferring your belief to your children is weak in the Christian faith. Every other belief jealously guard that. A Muslim is almost 100% sure that his son must be a Muslim. The church do not have do not have consciousness to that. In scripture, the prophet Isaiah brought a word to Hezekiah that he was about to die. And Hezekiah engaged God to remind God about the sacrifices he had made to God for his own life. When God spared him and he brought foreigners to see the sacred places. And God sent back a message through the same prophet to tell him what was going to happen to him and that his children will have been taken to exile. Ezekiah respond, respond to Isaiah was that your prophecy, you have God have said well, in as much as it did not affect Hezekiah, he did not care. Want his want his reign was was effective, and there was no war. But war will come during the time of his children. It's only David who understood that. That's why his kingdom, his presence, never leave the heart of God. The church is weak in effectively transferring knowledges about God, wisdom about God, the relationship between they and God. 
to their children. The church is always weak in this. My father role prepared me to the extent, you know, to the extent that I wear. When I was turned over to my father, even though he was educated and he was wealthy, every gift my father gave me from the age of four to the age of seven, he would make me to believe that that gift was given to me, was sent to me by the gods of his father. My father would give me candy. He would give me biscuit. He would buy me slippers. He would buy me trousers every day bringing one gift from work to me and told me the gods of his father, Nyagbeyawe, sent it to me. That's why at the age of seven, when my father turned me over May night, 12th May night, to the traditional warriors who were muscular, who were masked in different forms, gigantic in size, frowns in phases. A seven-year-old infant had no agita of fear in him because this God who have for three on broken years, every day sent him gifts, show him love, was right behind those warriors. So no matter where he were, no fear to go to meet him. When my father told me that the gods have sent for me. And so if the church is able to reference God in every interaction with their children, the love of God will grow in the hearts of the children from the infancy to adulthood. The church forgets that the grace that sustains it is Christ. They only do it occasionally. Where I come from, even in Liberia here, all of the different cuts, the monigi, the bon, the polo, the sandy, the gias, when they are graduating, when the children go to those demonic schools for two months, three months, four months, one year, and they are graduating, their parents kill at least a chicken or goat. People with money kill cows, sheep to celebrate that initiation for their children. The church own initiation, which is baptism, children go to baptism and return is a normal event, it's an ordinary event, complete ordinary event. <laughs> so, Many Christians do not even remember their day, the day they got baptized, because it is not relevant. They don't take it relevant. And so most of the church practices is either traditional and is always personal. There is no value that is passed from the father to the children. The, rarely you will find someone whose father was a pastor and their grandfather was a pastor and their great-grandfather was a pastor and they were proud of that. God encountered them somehow and those relationships are always personal. And so my father played that role, prepared me for that initiation. For four good years, I went through the initiating process. The witchcraft school at much go one year. I went four years, four years without seeing the daylight. Four good years without seeing the daylight. At six in the morning, I am blindfolded before the day gets clear. 7 p.m. when it's dark before 
the blindfold is removed from my eye. And I did all of these things to be prepared to see the deity that showed me so much love, quote unquote, through my father for three years. And I never complained. I never got tired. I was willing and programmed to do this ritual and do this preparation to meet this deity. On the day to meet the deity, when the day reached, I was escorted by the elders into the arena where the throne is mm -hmm. because the time took more than 20 years there were people usurping pretending to be called by the gods and they were given the opportunity to go and meet the gods and as they entered the arena they got killed they got lightning killed them they got devoid they got they got killed by different reasons, different means, and it did not return. And so when this time came, the entire, the entire tribe were in expectation, waiting for me. The place is just about between 250 to 300 meters from the entrance of the gate to the huge rock that is an altar. It was just between 250 to 300 meters. But it took me three days, three nights to get there because the presence of the arena was so intense, so heavy that at a time I will only have the strength to stretch my hands, fall down, drag myself, drag myself until I reach to this rock by the instructions of the chief editors. When I reached to this huge and mighty rock, I stood up as the voice commanded me to stand up. And all of a sudden, I literally saw that rock rolling up. Mm -hmm. Huge rock, maybe about the size of a 500 by 500 feet wide Whoa. and about 200 feet tall. And this rock rolled up and I saw a platform came from under the ice and stopped to the level of the ice. And I was asked to stand on it. I stood on it. It took me under the ice, and the rock came over me wow. and covered as Norman. The place was dark beyond description. But I was already trained for four years to not use my, my eyes to see, but my instinct. And all of a sudden, I saw this mighty demon, this mighty body standing before me. I saw his shadow before me. He came from my back. And uh, I heard him say, you are welcome, my son. I have been waiting for you. I turned around to see him. His hands were open. This body, this uh, 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 deity is, was about 12 to 15 feet tall. Huge. Mm. He had a mighty rod in his hands. His left side was like crippled. He had a wing that was broken. He fought the left wing on his arm. His right wing was still in tight. It's laid over him. 
flips a bait, but he drag, he take two steps and drag with his right foot and drag his left, left foot. Even though he could walk, he could move as fast as a jet, but he was recognized crippled. Mm. And I live, I stay there with him for 11 days. Every day, he revealed to me a year of my life. On the 11th day, he told me the history of the tribe and how he encountered the tribe. He showed me priests and elders who were in chains, hang up upside down, and fire was lighted outside under them as punishment for their unfaithfulness forever. Then he showed me other priests before me and elders who were faithful, and every evening they come and eat with him around a table. Hmm. And then he asked me if I wanted to be amongst the faithful priests or the unfaithful priests. <clears throat> of course, I wanted to be among the, the faithful priests. And he told me three major laws. He gave me three major laws. The first law, I would never touch cola nut. Cola nut is, is, uh, is something that affects tie and died with here. I would never touch it. In my region, cola nut is used for friendship, mm -hmm. for accepting. If I came to visit you and you did not give me cola nut, that means you did not receive me. I should leave. And uh, when you gave me cola nut, when I came to visit you and I rejected it, that means I did not come with peace. I have come with war. So uh, stopping me from eating cola nut meant that I should not associate with anyone because relationship by itself breaks any sacred thing. It gives exposure. So the devil always want to keep you in the dark. The second law he gave me was I could not be an effective priest at my age because the youngest priest, the second youngest priest ever was 57 years of age. And so for me to be effective, I needed to make a human sacrifice on a monthly basis. Every month, I needed to make a sacrifice. The third Lord he gave me was no matter how close my father and I were, my father do not know much than he know. I will never explain he and myself dealings with my father nor anyone. Nothing about him should be exposed to anyone besides what he wanted them to do as a sacrifice to him, what he will request. And after that, he gave me a throne that I will sit on. He gave me a machet that I will use as the symbol of authority and give me a talisman that is made out of an animal tail. He planted different carry shell in my system to work as a remote control for different things, for hypnotizing, for disappearance, for gun proof, for bulletproof, for quick access and uh, instant access to him, uh, 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 automatic access to him. 
and those things were planted all over my body. Then the throne, I was asked to sit on it. Instead of the platform that brought, took me down, the throne took me to the level of the eye, and the rock rolled back to a still. And my eyes and ears just opened to the mighty noise of party, sinking, dancing, celebration in the town. Then okay. I, as I, was, I was taught to sanitize the area and the elders came to meet me. And that's how I became the priest for the tribe. Wow. Couple questions before you continue your story. Um, number one, when you were under the earth and you were communicating with this entity for 11 days, did it speak to you in your language or was it telepathic communication? It spoke to me in my language. Did you sleep at all for those 11 days? No. Was there any physical tiredness you remember despite the fact you weren't sleeping? No. I was so energetic. Even when I came back. Wow. To, to the real world. Very energetic. And one of the things that, you know, and I... I, I drive this home because I deal with it all the time in our spiritual warfare deliverance ministry. You know, traditional Christians struggle with the idea of ancestral spirits. They, they, they don't want to believe it. They uh, want to say everything is a demon and they don't necessarily understand what a demon is anyway. But, I mean, when you were sitting down with these priests under the earth, these were ancestors of the tribe. Yes, but I, I also believe it could be a manipulation. It could be a manipulation. Um, uh, and spirit posting as as them. But I also know for a fact that uh, scripture says when a man died, his spirit returned to God who gave it. But then the Bible also say there are time for everything. Then the Bible also say the gift of God is without repentance. And so, for example, if God allowed a spirit to be born in a person, when they die, they're supposed to return to him. But he gave a time for that person to live. It's just logical. It's just my own reasoning. He gave a time for that person to be in the earth. If that time did not come, then the scripture that say, why die before your time? And you die before your time, that spirit can be manipulated. It can still be in the eye until the appointed time before it returns. And that's what most of, like me, when I was a priest, most of the people I kill, I kill and use their spirits on errands. Well, that's exactly what we're talking about. You know, one of the things that... Uh... God pointed out to me uh, along the same line, and then I will just jump right back into your testimony. You know, the Bible says it is appointed unto man once to die, and after that, the judgment. But if you consider that the judgment is either A, the judgment seat of Christ, or B, the great white throne judgment, um, there is a time between death and that judgment there's yeah a time and so what happens in that time i believe can be heavily manipulated by the occult world in Definitely. circumstances yes i believe it too it's 
it's just an area that deserves to be talked about, but, but we'll get there. Right. So now you're 11 years old. You have been accepted by the entity. You are being celebrated by your tribe. So, so what happened after that? So I became my priestly role. Uh, as a priest, as I said, everyone in the tribe who want to do anything, including getting married, including getting business, including getting new job, graduation, childbirth ceremonies, burial ceremonies, need to have the priest blessings, the priest attention. Also, a major part uh, The monthly human sacrifice is anyone, the priest, the elders can bring for that sacrifice. But there's a yearly ceremony that the gods request for a for one human being, a child from the tribe to transist from life to another life is believed that the person is not killed. So in this ritual, this yearly ritual, the gods will choose a child amongst the family members. And it become a pride for that family member that the gods choose a child. For example, you wake up in the morning and you see arches, a particular arches wasted in a particular form before your family house. When the family see it, they celebrate, they call every family members and they see it. They will call their friends to see it. Their friends will start favoring them because the gods have chosen someone from their family. And everybody would know that the sacrifice that year is coming from that family. Three days later, the description of the child will be placed with a collard knot. If the person is the third child in that family, you will see three collard knot. If it is a male, you will see the brown collard knot. If it is a female, you will see the white collard knot. So at that time, the family already know who the child is. So that child will be fed well, they will not allow that child to play like the other children. The child will be dressed every morning with chalk and everybody will come to give this child gift so that when the child goes, with the belief that when the child goes to the father, when they transist from this life to the lives, to the word of the fathers, the child will advocate for the family. And so like, like, like the church, will say in Jesus' name, the family, that family will be asking in that child name from the deity. Wow. So uh, 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 they will, when they even, when there is a competition between two members of the, of the tribe and uh, this other tribe have given, in my father generation, the gods choose from my fathers. In my generation, the gods choose from my house. And the God have also chosen a child from my house. So they have, they have maybe three different generations, maybe 10 years between, they have chosen three from this family. This family boasts over other family who have given once or who have not given. 
I don't know if you understand what I'm saying, but I just want you to see. I want the listeners to understand how how deceived the tribe were, and they were gladly giving their children unto sacrifices because they believe. Like like my mother husband was proud that the gods choose his wife to give birth to the priest, even though the fact was she was giving to another man. It did not mean nothing to him. She was cherished by him because of that. She was. Yeah. You, you're doing a great job. And, and, and I'm glad you're doing this because, I mean, okay, over here in the United States, right? It's a different mindset. So in order for our listening audience, or at least a large portion of it, because we do have listeners in Africa, but um, to understand the mindset of the world you're navigating, it requires what you are doing and you're doing a great job. And, you know, I mean, it is so interesting, right? Because over here, you know, it, it, would, it would be considered a capital offense to prepare your child for ritual sacrifice. I mean, you legally can't do that. But it's so interesting the, the way the occult world works, because what we do have over here in the United States, and, and quite a bit of it, is the satanic ritual abuse and Luciferian cults. And they have what are called breeders. And most of this activity here in the United States happens with people who are in a state of mind control, either through the cult or government project, projects and programs or whatever. And they do the same thing. They impregnate the women, oftentimes biannually on a schedule. The children are born and they go straight to the sacrificial altar. Uh, the, this is activity that happens all around the world. Here, it's not as open, at least plain as day. But folks, I mean, this is how the occult world powers up and handles their business. I, I, I appreciate you breaking it down. Please continue. Thank you. Um, and, so, and so those were my roles to make these different, different sacrifices the monthly sacrifice were personal, but this yearly sacrifice uh, was, was a service to the tribe, to the people, to keep the connection between the deity and the tribe. And if when anyone wanted a job and thing, they would come to the deity, they would come to the throne, they would come to the coven and uh, tell me what they want, and then I will ask the gods, and the gods will tell them, oh, go ahead with it. The gods will say, no, 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 you're not supposed to leave. You have a purpose here. You cannot go do this business. You're supposed to be around. So that was my role, protecting the tribe, hearing from the deity to the tribe, and hearing from the tribe to the deity. So President Doe, Master Sergeant Samuel Kanyandu, being a member of the tribe, also consulted me. And the devil is always looking for territories, new territories to conquer, and opportunities to conquer those territories, which the church do not do also. The church is comfortable. God himself have to stir up the first church before the spread. We have to bring persecution among them before the spread. The devil understands the benefits and it becomes a core value for taking new ground. And so when Do was the president and I became the priest, I took advantage of his position as the president. Move a mobile oven, a mobile coven to town opposite the, the barrack. And he consulted me, he met me and consulted me every day. We met every day. So I was his spiritual advisor at that tenor age. And I came to uh, break down most of the other sacred practices from, from the city. 
including the Masonic temple, and made him to close it and made every member of his cabinet, except few who were prophetic and, and, and understood and dodged it, and make every member of his cabinet to be initiated into the GRs, give them my mark and the, the functions, you know, by sacrifices. That make sacrifice of human were very easy for me because the government was my pulpit, were my puppets. And so uh, uh, I advised him that he needed to take most of the traditional warriors, most of the, 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 the able bodied men from the tribe in the military, in the police, in the security apparatus, and make him to get his confidants as members of the tribe so that we can take over out of the offices to, to officiate, to effectively, you know, carry on the, the manipulations or the, the, the control of this deity. And basically, I see many government around the world practicing this. When they become president, they are believed, the belief system that help them, they try to influence it, it make it influential. Um, uh, and so that was my rule. Helping every single member of the tribe to get a better position so that they can serve the deity better. Just, just uh, you know, to just to conclude on that. Mm. Mm -hmm. So politically, it looked, politically is interpreted as tribalism, that he's only empowering his tribe people, nepotism, even his people who were not qualified. Once it is my advice that they get those positions, they got them. So it was my tribe against the entire country. So when the war came, it came to confront Do, who was under my supervision and the tribe. That's how the rest of the tribes gang, gang up against the tribe, against the Crown tribe. And that's how wow. the war went against us. And this is the the obviously the first Liberian civil war. Yeah, there have been uh, my the president's master sergeant Samuel Kayando used a coup d'état to take over. Yeah, but uh, there were small small conflicts from 1847, but that was the first war, the my. first Liberian civil war, which is 1990. We started December. 25th, 24th, 1989, and continue until 2003. So your role as priest at this point uh, becomes more nuanced, doesn't it? Your responsibilities shift gears. To, I mean, tell us about your involvement as all of this begins to transpire? So when the war started, the entire nation actually gang up against the tribe. They were mobilized politically, resource-wise, ammunition-wise, against the tribe. International supports. Uh, when Do was not adhering to some international norms, including the America supported the insurgent. So it was a tough battle. Now, as a priest, I came to town, I brought Another priest, the priest who was an elderly man who was officiating in my 
in the state of a priest for the tribe called his core, Omen J. Swain. I brought him to town and brought two extra traditional warriors. One was Yom, Yomplu Tele and the other one was Yuzio Bawe. So the four of us was managing the battle in the city, in the executive, around the executive ground where the president was. So uh, I was controlling Yuzio Bawe and Omen Jiswen was controlling Tele. They were, they were rear automatic killing machines. You know, you just program them to kill and they will kill a random lay. All of a sudden, this old man, being experienced, was able to prophetically see that the war was going to turn against us. So he betrayed us and trade our powers to Charles Tiller. And then he, he, he left me, he left I alone with those two warriors, which was chaotic because they were actually programmed to kill. And the two of them cannot fight at one front. So I was betraying the two of them on different fronts. As I leave one front to go to the other front, one of them will be killing. If he do not see people to kill because he's immune to bullets, he's immune to knife. If he do not see enemies to kill, he kill his own people. So we have to kill, we have to get rid of, we have to bring one of them down. So we brought one of them down called Tele and only use your Bowie, I was managing. But it become intense for me because Our track, our spiritual traveling track, there were ambushment sets all in them, all around them in the air. And so I could not leave from Monovia to my traditional throne in Sino. So I needed to go through Sierra Leone, Guinea, Africos, then I slip in, collect powers, refresh myself before coming back through the same route. I could not fly over Charles Taylor territory because this old man have done a lot of ambushment. So, so what? Yeah. Before you continue, because what you're saying is absolutely incredible, right? And uh, well, for me, I'm just like, well, of course, that's how it works. But for listening audience, folks, uh, <laughs> let me just summarize I, what I think you're saying, and then you can clarify anything. So, okay, folks, what he's saying is that there were two guys that were completely mind-controlled super soldiers, these men were immune to bullets, knives. You couldn't kill them. And they just killed anyone they saw on a battlefront. Uh, and so my guest at that time was managing these super soldier robot-like killing machines. Yes. But because they would turn on their own people and kill them once there was no one left to kill. <laughs> they had to take one of them down. The reason why things got a little out of hand is because this guy saw that the war was going to not turn in their favor and sold out some of their powers, which meant that Joshua couldn't fly around uh, for transportation the way he used to. And now to get more power, he would have to go a longer route through several different countries, including Sierra Leone and Guinea. Is that right? Yes. 
Yes, in Ivory Coast, the Côte d'Ivoire. And so now uh, they take one of the uh, uh, killing machines down and, and, and Joshua is now to get more power going through these countries. Now, it, it wasn't so easy to go through these countries. You couldn't just like walk in and walk out being a, a priest on the level that you were, could you? You needed... No, no. Oh I, needed, I needed a passage. I needed a pass from each of the territory, the countries that we passed through, and I needed to make a human sacrifice. That's what made... made uh, when, I, when I left that ritual, when I left Monovia directly to my throne, I only needed a young blood to re-energize myself. But when I'm going through that route, I will need seven because as I'm going, I ask for excuse, for permission, and I gave a life. When I finish, I do one sacrifice at my throne. When I'm coming back, I give a life. So the three countries were two going and coming, two each going and coming. So the ritual I used to pay, I use. I needed one sacrifice for, I needed seven sacrifice for that. Now, why did they call you General Butt Naked? Well, uh, spiritual things is is unique, and there is. I always told people there is a thin line between the negative spirit and the positive spirit. Material. Dism. Material orientation is a hindrance to any of the spiritual realm. For example, if I had on clothes, it would take me between two minutes, 30 seconds to three minutes, 30 seconds to disappear. Because the material is a weight, colors, a weight. When I'm naked, it takes me between 28 seconds to 38 seconds to disappear. So I used to fight completely naked, especially when I started between the rule of priest and traditional warrior. After after the war turned against us because we did not have a, a needed powers are spent. Even the anointing, if you go to, re you, you fast and pray and you receive certain, certain anointing, as you minister, as you pray for people, it is being spent. Mm -hmm. So you need to recuperate. You need to get, get sacred and get more anointing. It's, it's, so it's the same way as you use these powers, they're being spent. When they are getting low, you go for reinforcement, you come back. That's why I needed to go to the throne for re-energizing. So that time I would take, when I'm back, I fought meaningful battles. So I was focused on meaningful things. I was not careless was spending since it was expensive, getting expensive. So that's how uh, the poor fathers, the zoos from the poor bush were able to use Prince Johnson and capture Do. They invoke him from the mansion and he got, he, he, he walked into their trap. They hypnotize him from the mansion and conjure him to the free port for them to capture him. When he was captured, the, the tribe fell weak and fled into exile. Three years later, the tribe decided to come back under the umbrella called Yulimo. When they came back, there were no money, there were not much ammunition, so they had to use the Muslims, the Mandingo, they came back together. 
But most of the traditional guys look for the priest from the crown tribe. They will definitely find the priest. When they phone me for me to help them, I could not share the powers with the Mandingos. So I was only protecting the, the crown soldiers until split came between the Mandingo again and the crown. So now the Mandingo had all of the monies. They were looking, they were digging gold, digging diamond, while the tribe, the crown tribe were just fighting, you know, to get back home. The Mandingos were looking for wealth and they were able to coordinate, uh, mobilize a uh, Mecca and uh, most of the Islamic countries to give them arms and ammunition. So the tribe was being fed by them. But then when they wanted to influence the tribe into their worship, so the conflict came. These people are sacred people. They cannot be any other thing besides submitting to Nyagbeyawe. So that conflict came and the two tribes split it. And because I knew that's why they split it, I needed to help the tribe. Even though most of the tribe members died in that split, so I needed to come in. Now, to come in with no ammunition, I needed to be a, a, a priest and a warrior. So when there is a major battle, I go as a warrior on the front line, immune to bullet, serve as a killing machine as one of those guys. After that, I have to cleanse myself to be the priest again. So I became, I was between the role of a priest and a warrior. Going to be a warrior, to be effective and not to spend much, I needed to be naked. So that's why when the American surveillance camera captured me in a newspaper, uh, local newspaper supposed to give a news and they got that picture. They never knew my name. They never knew who I was. So they just described me as general butt naked because I was naked, stuck naked. You know, um, folks, <laughs> at this point in the interview, you may be thinking this, this story is, is radical. I will tell you that my guest has one of the most well-documented stories of this nature, probably in the world. Um, you have your own Wikipedia page with quite a bit of data um, and cross-referenced, um, which is why, you know, I'm, I just praise God for you because, you know, your life is incredible, but now you you are on the other side of so many things having found Jesus. And I, I, I do want to get to uh, that part of the story, but there's still some more to tell. And, you know, I, I want to give you an opportunity to discuss a little bit about, you know, in your role as a priest, because you as a priest would have to do regular human sacrifice, right? And you were using, I mean, because I do want to come back to this, um, these people once dead to do errands for you. And uh, can, can you explain that concept a little more of uh, this element of what you were involved in? Come again? Uh, using some of the human sacrifices to run errands for you after they were dead yeah uh uh powers like disappearance mm -hmm. like uh uh immunity to bullets uh guns mm -hmm. they are they are all life they are the lives life of others uh God gave us spirit, soul, and body. That's what we made of. Uh, we were made spirit, soul, and body. If you read scripture keenly, you will discover 
God revealed the authority of man. Three times between Genesis 1, 26 to the end of Genesis chapter 1. In chapter 2, when God formed man and breathed into the nostril of man the breath of life, God never re-emphasized man's authority. So when God was speaking, be fruitful, multiply, replenish, subdue, have dominion, it was to the spirit. When man fell in the state three and, the, and increase in sin up to Genesis chapter six, where God got further and decided that he will whip man from the face of the earth for the increase of their sin, but maintain the seed of man in Noah and his children. After the flood, he came back again, and you will see almost the same words, be fruitful, multiply, replenish, subdue, was repeated. But God only stopped to three, be fruitful, multiply, and replenish, to subdue and have dominion was missing. So I'm saying this to say that the actual protection of man is in his spirit. It's the spirit of man. Hmm. That's why Proverbs says, anyone who have control over his spirit is greater than the mighty warrior. And if he do not have control over his spirit, is like a city that is broken down and without walls because your spirit is your actual defense. It's just the spirit is man's defense. So, 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 mm -hmm. if I kill a man, mm. if I, if I capture a man, And kill him. I'm capturing his spirit. His life. His, his body. And his soul. Left. Laugh lies. Because the spirit is captured. That spirit. Is what. I will use as a shield. Between me and any bullet. Wow. I don't know if it is understood. I understand what you're saying. Um, it, that, you know, spirit, that spirit is what I will use between me and every natural eye. So when I'm disappearing, it is the spirit of a person I'm getting behind. So when you look, because your normal eyes cannot see a spirit, you will not see through that spirit to see my physical body. You will so, not be able to see through that spirit to see my physical body. So wow. the human sacrifice, the human sacrifice is used for a defense for the one who sacrificed it. Everyone who came to me for powers, it is a life of another person I will use to give them that power. Everyone that came to me for power, it is the life of another person I will use for that power. Example, when the person is killed, their spirit is seized. Most of the time I seize their spirit and once their spirit cannot have access to their body, it is interpreted as death. Then they kill them naturally. When that spirit is released, it need to get, it need association, but it cannot locate its body. So it hovers in that area until I subdue it to my service. And in that time, you will discover that there are some houses that people call haunted houses. You in the house 
and things are moving and uh, you see images, you see movement and think. It is because a spirit that is in that house maybe was separated from its body and uh, 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 when it came back, it could not find the body and it's, so it's just around. So someone who is a spiritist is able to say he cast that spirit out, but he took it, he sees it for his personal use. Uh, that's the that's 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 the best I can use to explain that. Uh, okay, so I, I, I'm of course uh, I'm, and we haven't talked enough, I think, Joshua, for you to fully understand what's in my head. Um, but I'm tracking with you 100 percent person, and you know, <laughs> you know, I remember there was one night years ago. Um, this was when I was still living in Texarkana, Texas. And um, I woke up one night and my human spirit, right? He was standing over me in my bed. And so, you know, in my soul, I'm awake in my body and I'm like aware of what's going on. And, I'm, I, and so I asked my spirit, I was like, well, what are you doing? <laughs> Why are you standing over me? And he was just like, well, I'm protecting you. So there was definitely some yeah. major spiritual stuff going on, whatever reason it was going on that night. Um, and yes, my spirit was very involved in protecting my body and soul. I, I know that. And one of the so things me, that we've tracked okay. at our minutes, but go ahead. No, go ahead. Uh, I just wanted to explain in that further. Okay, yeah. Uh, one of the things that we've tracked at our ministry, because we do a lot of ministry to the human spirit, like we do soul ministry, we do spirit ministry, we uh, believe, you know, you minister to the body as well. And of course, that can be done with diet and exercise and just blessing the body. But the, um, the ministry to the human spirit really changes people's experience. Uh, they, they have much more success in encountering God on a consistent basis. Uh, they have a lot less harassment over time from whatever background they may be coming from in the evil spiritual attack that's targeting them. When the spirit gets very strong and activated, a lot of things shift even um you know the the power and the way anointing will flow through an individual goes way way beyond what they're used to as the spirit gets more and more strengthened so um okay i'm gonna pause what else did you want to add okay so you see uh like i was saying that the protection the true protection of man is to his spirit if you look at uh, 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 even Paul, Paul said it in First Corinthians chapter 2. He said, no man know the things of the spirit except the spirit of man. No man know the things of man except the spirit of man. Uh, 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 Paul said that. Said that. So uh, uh, if you're supposed to have five children, your spirit is the one who's supposed to tell you you're supposed to have five children. So even if you are barren, at 60, your spirit will tell you, say, no, in this system is, is a five children. So uh, keep pressing, keep pressing. So, but man lost contact, man lost relationship with his spirit when he fed in the garden of Eden. And until Christ came, the manual of man was in the hands of the devil. So he, so the satanics are able to to just tell men, do this, do this, do this. And when they do this, these things happen. They think it is the devil who done it for them, but you cannot produce what God did not give you. And so the spirit is your true protection. The spirit do not live in a lifeless body. So when you die, your spirit separates from the body. In fact, that's what is death. When you sleep, it's a seeming death. So once you sleep, your spirit do not stay in your body. If you are careless and you do not have relationship with your spirit, you will have dreams about things you have not seen because your spirit is just hovering, moving and thing. 
But if you have relationship with your spirit, almost every dream you have will be something that concerns you because your spirit will only be around you. He just sits over you to protect you. It's a normal process. Every time you sleep, your spirit leaves. If you have relationship with it, it sits over you and watch you. When any evil spirit is coming, your spirit fight it. Stop it from entering you. And your spirit also know, is clever enough to know that this earth is given to the flesh. And because there are three, your spirit will try to wake up your consciousness. And once your, your, your conscious, your spirit shall see, that evil spirit will be stopping your spirit from waking up you and there will be the struggle. So sometimes some people wake up and say, oh, I saw something pressing me. And it was, it was, I was not asleep. No, you was asleep. It's just that your spirit was close to your to your consciousness. That's why you, you witnessed that. And it was that effective as if to say you were not sleeping. Uh, also, you were going in a, a terrible terrain of foul or a veiled like terrain, uh, terrain. As you enter in the terrain, if you do not have relationship with your spirit, your spirit leave you because it's afraid. Say he did not give us the spirit of fear, but of goodness and sound mind. If you are not in relationship with your spirit, it's it's it's, it's coward. So your spirit will leave you and wait for you to the place that the presence of that foul, that veil, is not. So you will walk through that place very numb, your hair swollen, rising, and very numb. But you are in relationship with your spirit. The only thing you will notice, you will notice goose bum on your skin. You know, it is your spirit that leaving its inner position to come on the outer position to cover your flesh and confront whatsoever spiritual presence that is there. And most of the time, people who are spiritually aware. So when you have relationship with your spirit, as you're moving in, if it build, let it rain, like if or if witches have their altars around this area, they put it to junctions and they put it to environment to to invoke to 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 charge and confront bypasser. When you reach in those type of terrain where there are demonic covens. If your spirit is bold, the only thing will happen to you will uh, the spirit will leave the inner position because you are spirit in, soul covered, and body covers the two of them. The body is the front. But when you reach to those areas that are veiled and your spirit, you're in relationship with your spirit, your spirit come on the outer position. So that's why when you see goosebumps, it's your spirit coming out for information. Like if you receive something and goosebumps come on your skin, it is your spirit coming from the inside to the outer position to receive that information. So, so as, as you see, as you enter those terrains, your spirit come on the altar. Now, somebody who is knowledgeable or somebody who have relationship with the spirit, you will just see them speaking in tongues, you know, speaking in tongues as they're passing through that terrain. It is because it is the spirit altar that have come on the inner that have come on the altar and is confronting whatsoever veiled presence that is in that area. Contrary, if you do not have relationship with your spirit, your spirit flies and go to the place, to the end, that veiled in environment and your body will pass through that whole place, numb, hell, head rousing, until you leave. And if that, if that uh, 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 altar or whatsoever coconut is there is haunting you, it could capture you. It could, it could put, it could enter in you and put a different spirit in you that will control you. Maybe you will not continue to meet your spirit. It could take you different way, force you to commit suicide and do anything you want to do to you. Then you, you, you become hypnotized. You become captured by that strange spirit that is haunting 
that strange presence that is haunting people. But if you have control with your spirit, nothing will enter because your spirit will get in the outer position and protect anything from entering you. That is so, okay. And, and it's so interesting because look, uh, we do a lot of ministry, right? Where we are dealing with individuals that have come from heavily traumatic backgrounds, Joshua. And so satanic ritual abuse survivors, uh, government sponsored mind control, project survivors, um, survivors of cults of different levels, uh, Freemasonic children, children born to Freemasons at the 33rd degree level and higher. Uh, and, and a lot of these folks that we begin ministry to do not have their spirit with them at all at the outset of ministry. Their spirit is captured. It's bound. It's in a region of captivity. Uh, and one of the first things we have to do is go and get it back, which sometimes involves extraordinary deliverance, deliverance yep. from timelines, uh, realms, different locations, planets uh, at, in some cases, or constellations, um, locations in the earth and under the earth um, and places and regions associated with ancestors, witch doctors, programmers, and handlers. Sometimes they have to be confronted personally in the spirit. This is stuff that we've been doing for years. I appreciate just how much validity you're adding because we've been seeing it. And, you know, the, the, the sad thing is uh, you can't have this conversation with everyone because a lot of, uh, you know, unfortunately, leaders aren't ready for this level of truth. They'd rather just coach people to feel better in their situation rather than go to the edge of what's necessary and believe God for the resources to actually help people where they're hurting. <laughs> I, I, okay. So, thank you. Welcome. <laughs> <laughs> So, so, all right. So, so we've gone there. I want to come back now. Why don't you tell us about how you find Jesus? All right. Um, as I said, I was between the role of a priest and a traditional warrior. So uh, it is believed that uh, as a traditional warrior, Killing a random lay was defying my throne. So every time I have to go to fight as a traditional warrior, the elders needed to bring me in an innocent chai that I will use to purify myself for the dispensation that I'm going to fight. If I had to fight three times a day, they need to bring three different children for each one of the different fighting. And so this day, the battle was so strong against us, 1996. The battle was so strong against us and we were in, the, we were in central Monovia. Uh, this time, Chastilla, who was separate enemy, his NPFL group, have joined with the Mandingos at Ahaji Kruman to fight us because we are controlling a diamond rich place that we did not give the Mandingo access to. So as I was saying, I, as I said, I was functioning between the priests, traditional priests and a traditional warrior. 1996, the two factions, the two battles we had, one with Charles Tiller and his NPFL group, on the other hand, with uh, Alahaji Kruma and his Unimo K group, they were two separate people and they were fighting each other as we were fighting Alahaji Kruma or Unimo K, we're also fighting Charles Tiller and his NPFL group. 
Charles Sido was fighting us and fighting the Madingos, Alahaji Kruma. Alahaji Kruma was fighting us and Charles Taylor. But because of this diamond rich area that we capture, Alahaji Kruma submitted to Charles Taylor and the both battle. They were battering against us. So this battle was so intense. We had 74,000 of our tribe member in a 700 meter by 400 meter barrack. They were stuck in that barrack and we were on the outside fighting them for enemies to not come to massacre them. So uh, it was a very tense battle. Chastilla had rockets that he was launching in the barrack. Uh, uh, Alahaji Kruma had rockets, war tanks, they were launching in the barrack. So this war was very tense against us. So I was fighting two, three different battles a day. But as a priest, it's believed that when I was reduced as a traditional warrior to go to fight, it was defying my throne. So I needed to at peace and cleanse my throne to fight in every dispensation in a day. So the elders would bring me in, would find me this sacrifice before I went for battle. Now, this is in the city. It is not in the interior anymore. Some of the tribes, members, in the, most of them in the city and they're born in their children in the city. So when they were being sacrificed, some of the families started hiding their children. This knowledge of be, being in the city now, they started hiding their children when it was getting too much. So getting chai for sacrifice was so hard. This particular day, the elders was looking for a chai to give to me for this, for this sacrifice. And they are looking and they could not find a chai. If it was a female, I would use one chai for that sacrifice. If it was male, I would use four children for the same sacrifice because the female virtue is four times stronger than that of a male. The female have the generation virtue. So it's four times stronger. So the elders have seen two kids and they were looking for two more male. They could not find female. Three hours, constant death on my people. Snappers from up buildings shooting them down and the priest could not go to defend his people because there was no sacrifice. And a lady about the age of 30 to 33 brought to me her three years old daughter. Beautiful girl. For the first time in my life, my conscience poked me. And the child was given to me. In, she was smiling, being turned over to me. Most of the children before the rich men, they already wear out from cries, snot, tears, all in their faces. But this child was smiling, maybe because she knew her mother could not give her to anyone evil. So when the mother was turning her over to me, she was smiling. And I could not cross that point to kill that child. I kept that child for more than two hours, hoping the elders would have brought another sacrifice. And when I reached to this point, I always want to clarify that that woman was not a wicked woman. She understood her gods. She understood her culture and was willing to make any sacrifice to activate her God. The church is on the other hand, cannot make bigger sacrifice to save a soul. But this woman was willing to make the sacrifice with her only daughter to save her tribe at her knowledge. Well, she came back later 
an appeal if the child did not meet the criteria of the gods as you appeal to the God to save her people. At that point, I could not refuse. And so I took this child to the slaughter. and sacrifice her. With the blood stain of this child still in my hand, Jesus met me. And said to me, my son, why are you slaving? This was in my dialect. Say, Andrew, they kill you. That is my son. Why are you slaving? The war slave is, is a terrible insult. Key, Iman tribe. The war key means slaves. It's a terrible insult, Iman tribe. But Anju is the most appealing call from a mother to a son. In fact, the word Anju in my dialect mean the one that was detached from my labatical cord and is the mother appeal, most appeal to call his child. So even though he said I was slaving, but he said I was the koi, I was the, the, the one detached from his labatical cord. And that appeal make me to relax. Even though I'm not supposed to talk to any other deity besides the deity, Nyakbeyawe, but I relax. He was standing behind me in the cloud. He was four to five feet suspended from the earth. His feet was in the cloud. I was seated in the cushy chair, but I could not look back to look at him for the split of second. I was only looking at him from the corner of my eyes. His presence was brighter than the sun, far brighter than the sun. That's where I believe the scripture that says every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. His presence is demanding. It's, com it's so powerful. So, so powerful that I had to bow down my head as I was speaking to him and looking at him from the corners of my eyes, brighter than the sun. And I said to him, how can you call me a slave when I'm supposed to be your king? He said, you rightly say you're supposed to be your king, but you are living like a slave. A king, seven, is at his foot stood, but you have your seven, the devil, on your shoulder controlling you. Drop that seven of yours and enjoy your true kingship. And I say, I don't understand. He said, well, you will never understand. Repent and live and refuse and die. Then he disappeared. I'm worried when I came to myself. I'm worried that I just talked to another deity without the consent of Nyagbe Awe. That always going to be tough for me. And every night, 12 o'clock, I receive a visitation from Nyagbeawe until 4 a.m. in the morning. And so the whole day, in fact, I retreated from the front line. Two of my boys retreat from the front line. And I'm worried. 12 o'clock, Nyagbeawe came. He's dulled. He's not as sharp as he, he normally be. But I forgot to bring out the issue. 4 a.m., we, we separated from each other from the realm of the spirit. I came back in my natural. Then I remember, oh, 
we didn't discuss this. I'm worried all through the day, waiting for him. In the night, 12, 12, in the night, 12 midnight, I'm projected into the realm. I meet him, I forget. I see him door like a man suspecting his wife in an extramarital affair, but do not have evidence. So he's dull with me and I will forget explaining to him my experience with the God of the light. That's how I call, that's how I describe the, the deity, the deity of light. And I'm worried. Strange enough, Ekomok, the West African peacekeeping force insisted on a peace, on a ceasefire. So when God intervened and knew I was not fighting, he imposed, he used Equas to insist on a peace, on a, 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 a ceasefire break. So my people are being protected. And I am there worried. Then a church account or a ministry account called a soul winning evangelistic ministry. They said, uh, the Lord led them to pray for me. They were praying against the war and declaring that God should destroy the Egypt firstborn. And there is evidence that in that identical war, 1996, that is Tark, April 6 in Liberia, a lot of generals die from every front. And according to them, as they were praying against these generals, they were dying. And they came to pray against me. But a prophecy came by a woman that they should not pray against me, but pray for me because he, God, has arrested me for his purpose. And so they started praying for me instead of praying against me. Even though they were in Charles Taylor's territory, they were praying for me. And they were arrested several times because they were heard praying for me. And then the Lord told them, well, don't use the name General Botnicki anymore. Call him Joshua. That's how they started praying for me and calling him Joshua. My birth name is Milton. So, uh, so they started praying for Joshua. Then they gathered the courage. The Lord led them to come to me, to preach to me. They came for 54 days. They were fasting and praying for me until I accepted Christ. The very day I accepted Christ, I received several spiritual gifts. I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues. I could interpret tongues as tongues is being said, the gift of healing, the gift of prophecy, And I started preaching the very morning I gave my life to Christ. And from that time to today, the Lord have used me in different parts of Africa. Been invited to lead us around Africa to open their eyes to the risks of practicing ritualistic act. And many, by the grace of God, have given their life to Jesus. Even though it been a challenge, Charles Taylor became the president. And uh, the tribe got angry with me. Because when I got convited, I was preaching. They felt I exposed most of their powers. Charles Taylor killed them in the thousand and became president. Uh, 1997 and so the tribe could not forgive me they needed a new priest but they could not there could not be a new priest when there is a former priest so they had to kill me before a new priest so they tried several times to kill me more than 100 times and the Lord delivered me from it all and Charles Taylor could not protect me because he thought I was doing that for fame, everywhere I went to preach, the church gathered. Thousands of people gathered to hear the testimony. And he thought I was doing it for fame, for political reasons. 
So he was also against me to kill me. The Lord protected me and took me to Ghana, 1999. That's where I stayed. I claim responsibility for the life of 20,000. Everybody was denying, even people who were on record, Victoria record, video record, fighting, killing, denied. They were, they were amazed that I accepted my action. And when they asked me, I told them, the Bible says, he that know the truth, the truth shall set him free. And so water, they would kill me, hang me, jail me. I was obligated to say the truth. And that's what I said, the truth. And at least two persons to accuse you to be inducted. The Muslim leader on the team of the commission called Sheikh Kafuma Kone mobilized people to come to accuse me. And they could not find one person to accuse me with all the interest I did. So I was recommended for amnesty from all those evil that I committed. And that's where the scriptures say, when the sun sets you free, you are free indeed. I might go to jail. I might, uh, the Western, the global agreement about crime against humanity uh, that is implemented by the war crime court who indict me and I could end up in jail. But even when I went to jail, I tell you, I'm a free man today. I feel so free, free in Christ. And no wars can stop me from enjoying the freedom that Christ has given me. Even if I am hanged for my past, I know my soul will be received into heaven. You know, uh, I don't really know a better way to end this, um, Joshua. If someone's been listening to this and they want to give their life to Jesus right now, would you lead them in prayer? Definitely. I will firstly make them to, believe, to know that the Bible says If you believe from your heart and you confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, you are safe. And they need to believe that Jesus was not exchanged on the cross of Calvary as many as some faith projects and believe. They need to believe, they need to know that Jesus was actually born by a woman who knew no man. And his conception is just how the Bible narrated it. And he's lived on this earth as man for 30 years and started his ministry. And for three years, He imparted the word with philosophy that education and no development can surpass. And he committed no offense, but was arrested. He submitted his life to the crucifixion for their life, their personal sin, and the sin of the world. And on that cross, he died. He gave up his ghost. He was buried. And on the third day, with every security place put in place, to deny 
his teaching and his projection about his resurrection, he still resurrected on the third day. And today he seated by the right hands of the Father, as scripture described, advocating for us. They need to believe it from their heart, and they should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Then I pray for them and say, Father God of heaven, rescue your creations. Rescue your sons from the slain and the trap of the devil in this world as they have believed that the Lord Jesus Christ is their savior. Rescue them, Father. Our Lord, pray to you and deliver us into your victorious mighty right hand and requested that none should smash out from that right hand. As your sons and your daughters listening to me believe and confess Jesus as their Lord and Savior, Lord, hold them in that Victoria mighty right hand as our Lord requested to you. And may they never be smashed out by any devil. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen and amen. Amen. Folks, you have been listening to Discovering Truth with Dan Duvall, my guest evangelist, Joshua Milton Blayi. Until next time, God bless and God speak. You've been listening to Discovering Truth with Dan Duvall. This podcast is a production of Bride Ministries International. Visit our website at BrideMinistriesInternational.com to enjoy the Bride Ministries Church, the Bride Ministries Institute, free resources, and to support us financially.